Welcome to the Major Journal Club, everybody. <laughs> um, today's class is, is going to be really interesting. It's, um, this is going to be different than my usual workshops. Usually there's some aspect, in next month, for instance, we're drawing birds, and, and, and it kind of makes people think that maybe the focus, what is the reason you do nature journaling, I want to draw a pretty picture of a bird. Today's class is not going to have any drawing secrets in it. But I think that the stuff in today's class is going to make, do more than any of those other workshops, is going to make your own personal nature journaling joyful and exciting and a whole new level of fun. I'm going to be sharing with you today what I, the reason that I do it, and the thing that for me is the most high percentage thing that I get out of keeping a nature journal. And it is having a, a vehicle to play with curiosity. And um, the more you let the curiosity flow into your journal, the more addictive the entire process is, the more fun you're going to have. And um, I think you're going to discover that the results are, are also um, even more important for you. So um, with that, I want to be, I'm going to be sharing with you folks a little bit of the research behind curiosity. And then we're going to look at how to make yourself more curious. So curiosity is not a trait that you're stuck with. And it's not uh, something that just happens to you. It's something that you can actually intentionally do. It's like, hmm, I think I might do curiosity right now. And bam, you can actually make it happen. And you will, will, will make that happen today. Um, and then we're going to look at ways of enhancing that, how to make yourself more curious, and how and what do you do when you've got a question? How do you, how do you handle that? And some of the common pitfalls of solving those sorts of problems. So here we go. Um, this is a Nature Journal page by one of our Journal Club members. Um, Sylvia was out in her garden and painting wisteria. She's got these plants growing in her backyard, and she discovered that these two wisteria plants, that from a distance just sort of had a general cast, it had all sorts of, there were little subtle differences between them that she had never noticed before. She decided to get out of her journal and kind of take a closer look. The journal, more importantly than the art that is on it, is an invitation to looking more deeply at the world. And one of the things that can pull us into that is getting ourselves into a state of curiosity. When that happens, if you find something that is weird to you and you pursue that on the pages of a journal, um, that weirdness translates into new discoveries, learning something new about the world that you've been living in your entire life. She walked away from this experience understanding of what was going on in her backyard at a fundamentally different level and takes even greater pleasure in being there now. This is a Nature Journal page from another one of our members. Marcelo um, is down in Brazil and he was watching doves in a courtyard and observing their behavior. Um, first, this sort of wing waving behavior and trying to figure out what that meant um, and decoding it. This was decoding the wing flicks, so these things would be these little doo -doo -doo -doo. and this is, I love this, um, as the bird was getting a little more agitated, the wing flicks became uh, more, and it made this little wing flick EKG, right? <laughs> so think about this not just as, as, as something that you, you notice, but also he's taken this idea and figured out how to translate that down onto paper. The more you do this sort of stuff, the more you develop a visual fluency. So you have ideas, and those ideas can actually come out on the paper. Here's another one of uh, Marcelo's pieces, and where he was looking at the interactions between three different birds, male and female, and one of another species, as they went, uh, sort of chased each other around different trees. This is taking you through space and time. And think about this as, so he saw something that he thought was fascinating, and was able to translate that to paper. The curiosity that he had about it is what sort of carries you into these investigations. Some of our journal pages, you know, it's sometimes like, you know, here's a picture of a rose, and it's just a static picture of a rose. Very often, well, I'm not say very often, but sometimes you can draw a picture of a rose and actually not learn anything from it. But if you go into that same process with a mindset of curiosity, what is new, what is different, what can I learn from this, there will be mysteries and surprises that will be waiting for you. Um, curiosity itself has now been researched 
intensely um, because it's absolutely fascinating. Um, think of it for yourself, the experience of how you feel when you're curious about something. Right? Kind of get yourself in your curious body. How does that feel? Uh, what does it make you do? What does it make you want to do? You sort of feel that, that pull. Well, what is, what's interesting about that, that state is that in that curious state, your mind is actually working differently. What happens when you're curious about something is your brain gets a squirt of dopamine. That's your happy chemical. That's your reward center. And you get this little squirt of dopamine, and that interacts with your brain. It makes your brain more of a sponge. Whatever is going on when you are in a curious state, you remember it more accurately. You remember it in greater detail. Um, your learning is faster. And not just about the thing that you're specifically curious about, but because you've got these neurotransmitter flood, when you're curious, the uh, other things that are going on at the same time get to piggyback in there on this flood of dopamine. And they stick there too. So um, if you could only kind of harness this curiosity and like, like, oh gosh, I'd like to kind of get this more, wouldn't it be nice to be curious right now? You actually can. You don't have to wait for curiosity to come to you. You can go get curiosity whenever you want. And what it does then, when that curiosity is on board, it's going to change your brain chemistry. And so, if you know that, you can go out hunting curiosity. Kind of like, oh, this would be fun. Ooh, it would be even more fun if I was curious. What can I do to be curious? Well, I'm going to show you. Right? Part of it is changing your mindset from being an answer machine to a questioning beastie. And the, in our culture, I think especially for males, we have a feeling that like, we're supposed to have answers to things, right? So we're kind of trained, you know, you should talk with confidence and give your opinion even if it's based on absolutely nothing. Oh. <laughs> um, and um, the counterpoint to that is actually hunting for and looking for the questions that are all around you. So questions don't need to be a threat of vulnerability. Sometimes in traditional education, if you don't know something, you have to ask a question. Oh, didn't you read that chapter? Oh, you didn't study hard enough. So sometimes people suppress their questions because if you've got a question, oh, maybe you weren't paying attention because we already covered that, right? But it's impossible to cover anything. And it also makes the assumption that the stuff that was in the textbook was accurate in the first place, right? Um, so what we want to do is train ourselves to find the questions behind whatever our observations are. So it starts with observations of the world, and then what we want to do is let questions in. And to, and you can actively do this. So uh, I'm going to share with you two heuristics for asking better questions. So these are little lists of question prompts that I use all the time to make my questions richer and more interesting. So the first one is really useful because you already know it, it's, you have it memorized, and it's already right at your fingertips. Okay. So it's this list of the kind of journal, uh, the journalist's prompts, the who, what, where, when, how, why. Right. Um, this is a great place to start. Um, very often if somebody's looking at something, they will ask one type of questions. The most common questions that I hear people ask are who questions. So who questions are questions about identity. You're asking, uh, what animal is this? What is that? What is that? Um, and people want to know the names of things. And then we get the name of things. You know, What's that bird? You say, oh, that's a lazily bunting. Right? As if that makes a difference. Right? All right, so you now know the American Ornithological Union's latest name for this bundle of DNA that's been spiraling through the universe, right? What does that really mean? So the name is not the thing. I'm not saying names are not important, identifying things isn't important, and identifying things, you can actually tweak that to get a lot out of it, and I'll show you how in just a moment. Um, but that's not the thing. There are all sorts of other questions, but a lot of people just stop at who questions. So um, let's take a look at some of these question types. So this might be actually an example of how you can kind of make more of a who question. Um, here, one of our friends in the Nature Journal Club, this is a, a journal page from, from Sylvia, she is, she's observing these sapsuckers. 
She's got a, a drawing of it over here. She's got some written notes about what she's seen about it over here. Um, where it is. Uh, here it is, I like this. This is the, the, the map of the different sorts of shape that shapes that cover its back. So this is a, a map of its back patterns. What you can do when you're observing something, you're sort of on a who, right? You're making sort of notes about something, is try to see if you can get yourself to notice something about what you're observing that you've never noticed before. Right? And it allows you to regularly go beyond just identification to take it deeper. Can I use this understanding who you are to push myself a little bit deeper? You can even do that with your partner. At around the dinner table tonight, try to observe and talk to whoever you're sitting with um, to the degree that you can actually learn something new about them that you never knew before. Rather than have a chit chat, see if it's actually possible to do that. And because the world is infinite, here's the fun thing, it is always possible to do that if you are open to it. So not just accepting, like, oh, it's a sound effect, I see those, I know that. Try to push yourself to go through. So who questions actually can be really rich. I'm not knocking who questions. I write field guides, for goodness sake, right? So I, I, I got some who in me, all right? But the who, the, the who isn't where we stop. Here's another kind of fun who question. This is, this is really uh, cool. So uh, Rosemary here has, she's making some, some drawings of uh, stuff in a rainstorm. It was out in a rainstorm. I just love it. You can see that it's a little kind of bonus from the environment here. But here's a little who question. Fuzzy insect home question marks or so. So what's, what's um, going on right here? So who's this? Yes? Isn't it a uh, or uh, um, She says fuzzy insect home, which makes me think that it might be kind of cottony. Um, it could be a spittle bug, although those usually are in the joints right down here. Something like this might be a place where a spider has created an egg case on the other side of that, or a caterpillar could be pupating. It'd be really fun to see. It's a, kind of a, a, a fun mystery. Usually spittle bugs are at junctures like this, but it could be a spittle bug. You're absolutely right. Here's a what question. Um, Sylvia's out here, and she notices that there are these sunflower plants. Is it possible to close those doors? If there are doors. Um, um, there are some sunflower plants out here. And they have these jaggy, torn edges between the veins. And so she notices this. She's drawing it, diagramming it. And here on some of these other leaves, actually whole sections of the leaves are missing. But I really like this one. These, somebody's like tearing out these sections between the veins. So what's up with that? So this question, she walks around, not just, oh, I noticed something. But you want your brain to, go, to kind of want to know what's going on here, what's happening. And so she uh, keeps looking, and eventually she discovers goldfinches tearing out these little edges along the veins. Right? And so her first question is, what's going on here? She discovers it's these goldfinches nibbling these leaves. And notice that she doesn't stop there. She's wondering, OK, so why are they doing that? Oh, is this, she's wondering, is, are this, is this material for a nest material, for food? Uh, what is the purpose of this? So she's figured out the who's doing it. She's taking it to the next level. Essentially, she's found the question behind the question. Here's another what question. Um, Sharon is looking at a group of fox, uh, here, foxes. And she's wondering about what are they foraging on? Right? So they're rarely much, 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 much munching down here. What is the food type that they're getting? Here is um, a set of, of sketches that another one of our, our friends in the Nature Journal Club. And by the way, all these, these um, photographs you can find on our Nature Journal Club Facebook page. Right? If you want to sort of get inspiration from the sort of work that other people are doing, you can kind of go there and see what people are up to. So these were some jays that were making their little home on top of a motion sensitive light that they needed to keep clear for, um, for safety purposes. So they were regularly taking it down before they would make eggs. And, but what she did is she would, as you do that, is just to make a, a collection of all the different sorts of material that was used to make these eggs, to make this nest. So um, here's, you know, figuring out like, what do they make their nests out of? What is that, that, what are the sorts of materials? And this page is a study to that. Here's a where question. 
Um, so for my where question here, I have, uh, this is uh, Isabella, uh, is, is from uh, Germany. She is making notes about locations of lupin and other plants on a hillside. So she's mapping this out. She's thinking spatially what is where and how does that one over there compare with the other hillside over there. So thinking spatially, what's the distribution of things? That's a where question. Here's another example of uh, a where question. Um, these are where the different sorts of lichen and moss occur. Where do they grow on this old stump? I really like this comment down here. It, it, uh, the little lichen here reminds her of a Spanish dancer's skirt. It's a great, it reminds me of. Here's Marcelo again, and um, what he's doing is he's trying to, he's doing a, a how question. How do magnificent frigate birds do their flying without ever flapping their wings? All right? And what he's got here, it's, it's, he's, he got curious about this and just started staring and staring and staring and looked long enough to figure this out. Here's, this is really neat, check this out, he's got, this is the top view here. These yellow zones can, uh, correspond to these yellow zones up here. This is the side view of what they're doing, this is the top view. So they come along, do a little curl, come along, do a little curl. So they come along to the front of these gusts of wind that are moving across the water surface, and as they do that and they get to the front, on the push of that, that pushes them up into the air, and then they soar down and then up into the air onto the next one. So he's, how does this work? How do they do that? He's figuring that out and putting that down onto the page. Um, let's see if there's a door perhaps that we can close. No, no, I'll, 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 we'll, we'll ask if we can because I'm, I'm worried that uh, it's going to make it difficult for people to hear. Um, so this is really fun. This is uh, some field notes uh, from Fiona Globally who is a 13-year-old nature journaler up in the Sierra uh, Nevada. And um, look at what's going on. First of all, look at the number of questions. She's got questions popping up all over her page, right? She has tapped into curiosity here. Um, but I just wanted to kind of show you down here, there's a why question, right? So she's made an observation. So the questions start with observation. She goes, wow, check this out. There's, um, the bottom leaves on this are are, are not green, they're, they're red. So what's up with that? So she says, why? Um, does it stop photosynthesizing? And then again, she finds the question behind that question. Why would it stop? Right? Really, really interesting. So not just kind of going, oh, that's how it is, and accepting it. She's wondering, actively wondering, all right, what's going on here? So that's a little look at this who, what, where, when, how, why, how you can use that to take your questioning process and expand it. The next uh, one is a little bit more difficult to remember, so I write this down into the back of my journal. I um, stole this from an international school, from Sunny Bray um, International School near my house. I was walking through the school to try to figure out where I wanted to bring my kids to school. And in every classroom, there was this list of question prompts on the walls. And I thought, at first it was just wallpaper to me, and then I started looking at it, and then all of a sudden, I realized that I was staring at one of the most brilliant heuristics I'd ever seen for asking better questions. And this was being taught to these kids from the first, from, from kindergarten all the way through the school. And so I immediately got a piece of paper and started writing this down and talking to the teacher about how do you use this. But either my kids are definitely going to the school because they need this, they, they go somebody else, the place else, I gotta teach this to them. And I've also been sharing with other people. Uh, I, I altered it slightly, I reorganized it, and add, added one thing to it. But this is our list. I added patterns here, because that for me is a, uh, a really useful one. But check this out, form function. Uh, so form, what they're asking here is, what is it like? How does it look? Function is, how does it work? All right. So what is it like and how does it work? Uh, causation, why is it like that? Um, and think about, you know, think of it, you could do this with any object around you, right? If you're, 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 you're looking at that, uh, that, that, that 
the, the little wildflower with the red on the bottom. Um, you can apply any of these questions to that. So change. What was it like before? What's it going to be next? How fast is it changing? What's the rate of change? What's going on here? In, we tend to think of the world around us as static because this is how we're seeing it in this instant. If you're deliberately looking for change, you can see it. Connection, how is this related to or connecting to other things in this environment? Um, patterns, this is the one that I added. I find myself using this one a lot. I will look at something and be like, what's the pattern here? What's the pattern here? I could be looking at birds moving around and I'm intentionally looking for patterns, looking for patterns, looking for patterns. And then I'll often find them. So I'll say, what's the pattern here? Show me the pattern. Because is there a mechanism behind that pattern? If I see a pattern, is there a mechanism behind it? You know, of course, sometimes when you're really looking for something, you make it up. So just as long as you're aware that you may be making up a pattern where there is none, right? This is useful, right? Um, yeah, more about bias in a moment. Um, these last two are fascinating, and I'd be very curious to see what happens to the kids in this school as as citizens, if they're regularly thinking about these last two, the perspective was these kids were on a regular basis asking them, what are the different points of view on this? Whatever it is, what are there different points of view and what are those? And holding those with dignity and respect, not that like, oh, you disagree with me, you must be wrong and bad, but what are different points of view and where do they, where do they, where do the points of view diverge, where do they come together? They're thinking about those on a regular basis. Where would we be in this country if we adults were behaving this way, right? Like, you know, you're red state, you're blue state, you're wrong, no, you're wrong, right? Here's the newsflash. We're both wrong and we're both right about different sorts of things, and we can't tell the difference. So people who disagree with us are actually right about some of those things, right? And we're so into our box that we can't tell, right? It's not that there are insane people out there in me, right? We're people. And if I'm convinced that I'm right about everything, um, I have a lot of confidence in, 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 in my delusion. Right? Uh, but these kids are regularly coming up facing that. And those last one, reflection, what's my evidence for that? How do I know? Wow. Isn't that powerful? What is the evidence for that? So here's a statement. What's my evidence for that? Yes, sir. Well, I, I think that um, I, I think that if all of us embraced that idea, right, we would be in a, a better country. I think that, um, and that's so. It starts with me, right? So it's got to start with me and me realizing that a bunch, some of the things that I think are absolutely right are I'm wrong. Right? Or there are other ways that are perfectly legitimate to also see those things. I'm not saying everything is relative and you can't make any decisions here. But to, to, to face, to move in this world with some humility. I think that's powerful. That's humility is powerful. Because right? it gives me permission to change my mind in the face of that right? um, So, the, uh, if it's, you want to kind of get a review of that, I have a, a, on my blog, which is johnmirlaws.com. I have a blog post called the Curiosity Framework, and you can sort of reread that if you want to kind of get some of those 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 points again if you didn't write it down. But I just write this list at the back of my, my journal. Sometimes when I'm looking at something, I say, you know, I haven't thought about connection in a while. As I'm sketching whatever this is and making observations of whatever it be, could be a lion on Serengeti. Um, the I will be. I'll be thinking about connections, how is this related to other things? And that will prompt me just to think differently. And thinking differently is good for its own sake. Right. Also with this, I can expand this set of prompts by, on any question, as you saw in some of the examples before, where people found the question behind the question, is looking for those opportunities. I've got a question. And then say, is there a more richer question behind that question? I've done some uh, questioning strategy activities with, with kids where you, you, you try to, you're looking at some phenomenon and you try to generate a whole bunch of, of questions. And you write down all the questions that you come up with. And invariably, the most interesting ones are not the ones at the top of the list. You actually have to play around with questions for a while to start to get to the richer ones. 
And so you can do that yourself. You've got a question, just think, oh, what's the question behind this one? Can I make this, you know, ooh, here's a more, even, even more interesting question that's hiding underneath that one. Another strategy is to think of scaling your question. So I've got a question, and I, I want to think of that question on whatever scale I'm looking at here, and then zoom in or zoom out. Let's say I'm thinking about a, a, a where question. Um, where do the, the, the lichens, where, where does this lichen occur? I could be looking at a rock or a stump there. Where do those lichens occur on that? I can zoom out. Where do those lichens occur in the forest? Are they more on in the shaded part of the forest? Or are they more in the sunny part? Um, what is that north face, south facing slope? What is, what is the geographic range of this, this lichen? So that's just taking this where thing and going, right? So you can do that with all sorts of questions. Think about how you can do that with thinking about time. You know, when do these birds start doing that? Well, you could be thinking about in a day, you could also be thinking about in a season. You could be thinking about in a year. So there you've got this, this set of tools for pulling questions out. And the thing is, that what you want to do is to be deliberate about asking questions. I don't just want to kind of look at something and then ask all the questions. If, if I know that this, this curiosity thing is going to trigger a dopamine surge in me, I want to, I want to make myself lean in, and I can make that happen. And once it happens, I've got all oh, curiosities happen. And it's going to start to carry it there. So you can prime that little curiosity pump. You've got some phenomenon in front of you, and it starts with just observations. Um, and what you want to do is be saying your observations out loud, writing them in your journal, drawing them, interacting with those observations, and then looking for those questions as those questions come up. As the questions come up, I'm going to say those questions out loud. And um, so you see something that's interesting. You just want to see what's the question behind that. Right? So here's a little phenomenon here. And what I want you to do is, with the people who are sitting near you, so like the three of you might be in a group, the three of you might be in a group. You want to, this is much more fun to do this with other people than just by yourself. So kind of sidle over to somebody near you. And what you're going to do is I'm going to ask you to go on a curiosity riff with this. Saying your observations out loud, you can all be talking at the same time. And um, the, what I want to do is get as many questions out on the table from what you are observing here. Ready? Let's give it a try and go. So, 
But the, this, this, this question, it starts, you make an observation. These things are raised, right? And then what you do is you just take the next step. You find the question behind that observation. Any observation can have this, this, this cluster of questions radiating off of it, right? Um, this time what I'm going to try to do is prime the pump a little bit. Because um, remember I said that, so you can use initially any of these strategies you want. On this next one, just start you know, with, you know, you make some observations. But I want everybody here in the room to say, what's the pattern here? What's the pattern? Say it right now. What's, what's the pattern? pattern? Right, what's going on with this pattern? What's behind that? Right? With the idea of patterns in mind, just notice that it is going to change the way you are going to ask questions about whatever you're looking at. If non-pattern related question comes up, that's great. Right? That's fine. But just notice that if we're going to just initially sort of think like, oh, is there something going on right here with patterns? That your brain will harvest different sorts of observations and ask different sorts of questions. So that's why very often I'll just pick a random prompt and have that be my little primer while I'm observing anything. And I regularly change that up. So on this next one, we're all going to try pattern. You ready? Beep. And go. Right? And here we go. 
the better off we are. Um, so let's see, hold on a second. Doot, doot, doot. All right, here we go. So um, some people write in science, we write these journal articles, right? And then, and that's in that journal article, they say, this is what we found. This is um, how I figured that out. This is the process I used. This is what I think about it. This is what I think it means. And what happens in science is somebody puts that out there, and then somebody else comes along and says, oh, that's interesting. Let me try to do that over here. Oh, yeah, I got the same thing. And I got the same thing over here. And then this person over here tries it, and they got the same thing. They say, you know, we all got the same thing. That's pretty cool. Huh. We're able to do that. Now, you might have something there. Right? Um, or you figure out, like, I didn't get that. I didn't get that. I didn't get that. You know, you, this, sorry, you, sure, you got that, but I, I don't think what's going on is what you think is going on. Right? So that's what happens in the community of science. And what happens then is this, this article gets picked up by, uh, by a journal, a peer-reviewed journal. So what a peer-reviewed journal is, it is a group of scientists who are sitting together and they're going to assess the quality of the research that comes in on a paper. Is this good statistical methods? All right. Um, is there something that, you know, a major source of bias in your data that you're not thinking about? And if it seems legit to them, then they put it into their journal. If you can't get it into that journal, then people will try to maybe get it into this lesser journal, maybe this lesser journal. And there are even journals out there that will print your stuff if you pay them money. Huh. Right? So that means just because this is published doesn't mean you want to hang your hat on it. Other things to think about, really, who funded that? Right? Was there a source of bias that you wanted to show somebody that you want to make them happy? And then in the, in, the, in the paper, how big is your sample? How'd you go about getting that? Is there a bias in your sample? You know, most psychology reports, um, who's, who's the, the study group for most psychological experiments? Um, people call them. They ask people to come to study. Yeah. So it's already self selected so it's, it's self-selecting college students, usually freshmen and sophomores, in a psychology 1A class <laughs> on a university. Usually white, middle to high income, right? Predominantly male, right? And this is who you get in these, these, uh, these, these classes. That's who, and then like, you're gonna take 20 of these people, you're gonna do your experiment with them, and then make some extrapolations to the whole human population? Really, that's interesting, right? <laughs> Um, so that's why looking at the, 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 the study and what their sample size is, what their methods are, ends up being really useful. You know, also, is it this single study? Is it that they, they I, I got this result over here? Or have, is, have a bunch of other scientists found that same thing? What happens in science is this first person does this thing, says, look, I find this wheel, then we'll go out and test it. But that's different what happens in the news media, right? What happens in the news media is that somebody goes like, oh, oh my gosh. Uh, this is what I found. And then the news media goes, oh, wow, you know, the acai berries are a miracle cure for cancer, scientists prove. Right? Totally taking this out of the context of this conversation. Right? And so they jump the gun and say, look, this is what scientists have discovered, this miracle cure. It makes us think there are all these miracle cures in the pipeline. Right? No, not so much. Right? Um, because, you know, you get those things replicated, maybe they can't be repl replicated, and a lot of them can't, all right? So the journal article comes out, and then there's the press release from the university that funded it, and they want people to notice them because they want to get donations, so they have a motivation to exaggerate it in their press release, right? Then some science reporter might pick that up. Maybe they've got chops in science, and they're looking at what the sample size is, and kind of like, eh, that sample size is so much, right? Um, or maybe the mainstream press picks it up and runs with that. Or maybe somebody who has no clue about what's going on, like me, a hack, kind of gets on it and gets on their blog and says, well, scientists have discovered that. Or maybe an ideological blog, somebody with a real axe to grind and an agenda to prove who filters everything through this an ideological filter, gets a hold of this thing. If you're getting your stuff from here, it's pretty far from the conclusions that are up here. Right? 
But even let's say you have a peer-reviewed journal and you're getting it from that original source. Um, that doesn't mean that you can even fully count on that, right? Scientists make make mistakes, right? This is a uh, this is an article, a, a, a published research finding called "Why Most Published Research Findings Are False," right? And we're finding that in published research findings, there's a lot of mistakes, right? Mistakes happen, um, and sort of an example of that. Uh, well, actually, here's, here's another one. This is on cancer research, and they looked at the most highly cited cancer studies, the ones that in other journal articles people say, like, in this study, they found that, therefore, blah, 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 the ones that people are basing all their opinions on, right? They try to replicate these things, and um, here's, a, here's, here's what they find. They found that when they did that, 30% of, of the top most widely cited randomized controlled trials, so these are 30% of the the, the best quality studies, they were wrong. And when they had uh, s uh, techniques that were not as rigorous, it was five out of six were wrong, published studies. This does not mean that, oh, science can't tell us anything. This doesn't mean that um, this process is completely use useless. As a matter of fact, who are the people who are saying this? Scientists. What we're saying is that we found some problems in the way we're doing things, right? Take that into account as we're making decisions, right? And keep that humility about the statements that we make. This still is our best sort of way of kind of moving forward, but we have to be really rigorous. Sort of an example of there can be sort of systematized biases. For a while, like a lot of um, mistakes were getting into journals because of a phenomenon called p-hacking, right? And p-hacking wasn't on people's radar. But a lot of people did it, a lot of stuff got published, and I were realizing, oh man, not so much. That, that does not make any sense. And we're withdrawing some of those, article, those, 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 uh, those, those, those articles where we're trying to figure out how to kind of, uh, you know, it'll, it'll give you an example of how p-hacking would work. What are the odds? that everybody in this room is born on the same month? No. no. What are the odds that we're all wearing the same color shoes? Better. Better. What, but still pretty low. Yeah. Right? What are the odds that everybody came here wearing the same color shirt? Even lower than shoes. Probably lower than shoes, because there's a lot of black and brown shoes. Yeah. Right? But if I asked you 700 questions of that nature, what are the odds that one of them would be like, yes, we are, right? We've all got sketchbooks. Yeah, yeah, we all have sketchbooks. Right? Yeah. Um, just because I asked 700 questions, eventually, statistically, something is going to be significant. It's not that there's anything about you, about, you know, the people who come to something like this and their shoes, right? Or their, their, their choice of shirt color on that day. It's just that you throw out enough questions, something's going to that's not significant is going to show up as significant. That's p-hacking. And so now the scientists are realizing, yeah, don't do that, right? And so we're trying to kind of figure out, oh yeah, that was some p-hacking in that article there, that was some p-hacking. So we're trying to get in there and fix it. The idea here is not that, yes, science makes mistakes, but science is a self-correcting process. And the people who are pointing this out are the scientists themselves. And so when those things happen, somebody publishes this, like, yeah, I didn't find that sort of thing. And that, an understanding that those corrections are a fundamental part of this process, helps you use science as an effective tool for moving the ball down the field. Does that make sense? All right. So, um, uh, so, a big part of the, the, the problem here is also this idea of what we call confirmation bias. We have a tendency when we're doing our own research to believe what we already believe. And uh, so I, I love this little cartoon. I don't know if this can really show up on the, 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 uh, the, the screen there, but the guy says, I've heard the rhetoric from both sides, time to do my own research on the real truth. And the thing that's come up with on the Google search is, it says literally the first link that agrees with what you already believe completely supports your viewpoint without challenging you, challenging it in any way. Yes! See, there's confirmation. This is called confirmation bias. 
that the things that feel right to us feel right to us. And things feeling right have nothing to do with rightness. Feeling right is a feeling we have, right? People who disagree about things, they both they have a feeling of rightness about those, right? So that feeling you have doesn't have anything to do with rightness. It's just a feeling. Right? Not, to, not to say that there's anything wrong with a feeling, but that it doesn't have anything to do with rightness, right? So we've got our confirmation bias. We have to understand that we all have that bias. And if there's an inconvenient truth, we're going to find reason to discount it, right? Um, and you also have to think of, you know, am I someone who, in the face of evidence, is willing to change my mind? And that's harder than we think because um, a lot of the ideas that we have, a lot of those are socially defined. I get what I think about whatever it is, partially because of the social environment that I'm in. And if I start challenging those ideas, my friends think I'm a traitor. So if I change my mind about something based on evidence, people are going to say like, oh, you're going to the dark side. Right? You can't think that. Right? That's bad. Right? So what if we actually made our decisions up independently and that was okay? Right? Why should what you think about gun control have anything to do with your opinion uh, correlate with what you think about global climate change? Right? But those ideas are correlated. Right? They're totally unrelated. But it's because of the social matrix that we're all in that those things travel together. And for human beings, being part of the tribe ends up being more important than being accurate for the truth. So we tend to just go with both what our tribe says and we go with what, and this is true for both the, the, the right and the left, we go with our tribe, right? Um, and we also um, kind of discount what is inconvenient to us. And you're thinking, oh no, but I don't, but I'm going to actually prove to you that yes you do, right? How many people um, drive around in their cars and talk on their cell phones? Handheld, up to your ear, driving around. Okay? So for people who are watching on the video, nobody in the room is raising their hand, right? <laughs> Perhaps a few of them do, but it's not socially cool to say that, right? So, so, so let's just take this a little bit further. Um, then we now have these cool Bluetooth hands-free systems that are legal, and you know you can you can drive around and you, you punch it in, your phone connects to the car, and you hear it through the car radio. How many people use a, 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 a hands-free Bluetooth system, right? And we drive around and we feel pretty good about this, right? Because um, we're not going to go around endangering other people. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, sorry about that. You know. Um, but here's, 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 some interesting, here's some interesting data. So this is data from um, Foundation for Traffic Safety. Um, you can go get this free online. You can look at their sample sizes. You can look at their methods. They put people in these little helmets that map, track their eyeball movements and reaction time and put them in driving simulators, put them out in real cars out on the road, rolled balls in front of them, just did all these sorts of things. And they looked at what their responses and reactions were with different degrees of distraction going on. And what they found, here is just how much they're able to notice hazards around them. The person driving around in their car, there's a hazard, they see it. They're listening to the radio a little bit less. Book on tape, right, it's a good book. Um, um, less, so check this out. This is a passenger in the car, but this passenger is not behaving the way that normal passengers do. If you drive with someone like my dad, you're driving along and all of a sudden you're like, it's not here, right? And you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And so you're constantly doing this sort of warning you about, um, or at least when you're doing the difficult merge, that person stops talking, the whole conversation ends while you're, you're trying to get into the next link, right? And then you do it as, as things kind of mellow out, you go back into your conversation. There's actually another set of eyes there. Um, this passenger wasn't doing that. This passenger was like, yeah, 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 yeah. What do you think about that? Like trying to like, keep pulling you into this conversation. Ugh. Well, it turns out that person is very distracting. That person is as distracting as the handheld cell phone that is no different than the hands-free system. There is no dis difference in glances and hazards between those people. 
right? And then if you're doing, you know, text stuff, it really, you know, it, 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 you're going to be running over everybody, right? So um, this is, is break reaction time, single by themselves. Uh, it looks like live, listen, God, listen to more radio. Um, um, and then, but, but look at, you know, the, the hands held and hands free, there is no difference, statistical difference, in the reaction time, right? So talking on our cell phone hands free, right, is no different than holding that thing in your hand. Isn't that sobering? And what it is, it's not about having the thing in your hand. What it is, is the bandwidth of your brain. Our brains cannot cognitive, handle the cognitive load of engaging in a conversation which takes brain bandwidth and managing this, this, this steel cage traveling at 65 miles an hour, right? A steel and plastic buggy you're shooting on, uh, around in. We can't handle it. Just like you can't handle having a conversation with somebody and eavesdropping on somebody else. You have to stop your conversation to eavesdrop, right? Same thing. When you're talking, because that, that talking takes bandwidth. We don't have that much room in our brains for doing both those things. And so that's why we get into trouble. So, um, how many people sort of on the basis of seeing this are thinking to themselves, huh, I guess I'm going to stop talking on my hands-free system. Right? Scientific study could be wrong. Right. So now this is, this, is, this is where what we call motivated reasoning comes in. Right? We find reasons to discount the study. Right? You know, I, I think it's a legitimate study, and I've tried to change my behavior to it. Here's my confession to you. On a regular basis, I find myself making an elaborate web of excuses why in this place and this time, just for this thing, oh, it's going to be okay. Because it's convenient. Because it's convenient to me. Right? And I know the data says that is, makes it just as likely that I will kill myself or others. Right? I'm not a rational operator based on data. I'm trying to be, but the motivation to do all these other things it can pull me in all sorts of different directions. So that is that's that that's part of this confirmation bias that you know we believe if this said what you wanted it to say, you go like, oh great scientific study. Right? The fact that it doesn't, you're kind of like, oh, well, your methods, I don't know, right? Um, so, um, this, you know, here's just one last little uh, confirmation bias example. Um, do you know what these characters are? Right? Notice how sure you are that you know what those characters are. Okay. And now look at your level of assurance. <laughs> right? Uh -huh. So, um, that feeling of assurance and that change in it, that was when you looked at it, you looked at those letters to confirm that you knew what it was. Right? Um, and that's how easy it is for our brains to kind of trick ourselves. You go on the web, here's you, here's this constellation of ideas. Right? What happens is, some of these ideas are going to be repugnant to you, some are going to be exactly what you want to hear. Now you do a Google search, or you get a YouTube search, and YouTube comes in, and what these, 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 the, the, these, these, these online systems, it's really not free. Behind the scenes, there are people getting paid by the click. So when you click on something, somebody's getting paid. Right? You click on this, somebody's getting paid to do that. So they want to get you to make more clicks, because then there's more money moving around. More click, 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 click. You go click, 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 click on something a lot, you make somebody really happy. Right? So people are paid by the clicks. So what these systems do is they figure out what sort of stuff you, because of your search history, are going to click on more. And they will serve up to you a constellation of ideas that fit what you're going to click on. Right? And every time you do a search, you refine the precision of their algorithm. Mm -hmm. right? Until it shows you exactly what you want to see. Right? The more you are on the extremes of any opinion, the, 
more intense this effect is. So if you started doing research on, on neo-Nazis, right, it will start to radically alter the kinds of things that come, you're like, how did that get into my search options, <laughs> right? The more you are out on an extreme, the more this effect is, until you finally forget that there are even other ideas out there. All right? So when you're doing your Google search, all right, it's not a neutral playing field. It's not, it's not an even playing field. All right? So all this we take into account when we're going to look it up. So looking it up is not just a simple thing. We are face to face with our biases, the biases that come through the systems that we use, the biases from the community that we're living in. Right? We have to acknowledge that. And that's just part of being human. We're just going to do the best we can within that. But again, humility is important. The next idea is, so I can look it up, but I can also, um, I can make my own observations. So all that stuff that went in the book about what Brewer's Blackbirds do came from somebody sitting on a stump and watching Brewer's Blackbirds. Right? You can read somebody else's research about it, or you can sit on that stump yourself and watch the Blackbirds. So um, the next approach is, you can figure stuff out by your own personal direct observation. All right? So I call this the let's see approach. The other is we have let it be. Right? We have um, let's see. Um, and for let's see, one of the primary distinctions you're going to have to make is separating your explanations from your observations. And if you are deliberate about that in your journal, you will really help yourself think clearly. So um, the, the observations, those are the facts, just the facts, man. Right? Um, the, that's different than your explanation from it. So if I say, you know, yesterday I was at the Golden Gate Bridge and I saw humpback whales lunge feeding under the bridge. Actually, we actually were doing our, my, our, our class, and they were outside the window. They were lunge feeding every once in a while while we were having the class. Everybody would go, Aah! right? <laughs> so that's actually not a description of what I saw. What I told you was my, um, that's my explanation of it. What I actually saw is every seven minutes or so, these barnacle-encrusted, um, you know, snouts would blast this far out of the water, water pouring off with a huge open maw, closed water streaming out the sides, uh, birds flying all around them, and the, the whole thing would then mm, veer off and go down to the side. And, or sometimes just mm, uh, like that. Um, and uh, my, my explanation for this is this is humpback whales because of the number of barnacles and stuff and um, the shape of the head, and um, that there, this is, is, is lunge feeding behavior, what I'm, what I'm going to call lunge feeding. So I, I want to be able to, in my journal, make a distinction between what are the actual observations and what is my interpretation of that. We have a tendency, our brain likes shortcuts, and one way it does is it will see things, label it, and you're now, once it's labeled, you're not seeing the actual observations. Your brain is saying, I understand what that is, right? That's a hand, right? I, I, I don't need to pay more attention to that because we've got hand, all right? But um, when you're, you're making your observations as a, as a scientist, what you want to do is start with just your observations, record it all in your journal. What you see, what you hear, all your senses, get that down there. Use Use writing, use drawing, use measurement and quantification. You want to use all those different systems to describe what you see as vividly as possible. Um, it's not that, you know, pictures, they say pictures are worth a thousand words. Well, I guess that pretty much depends on the picture and those words, doesn't it, right? Um, it's not actually that one is better than the other. They are fundamentally different. And the brain you, way your brain will work when you are drawing is different than the way your brain will work when it is writing. So when you're making these observations, if you're intentionally using both of those, then you're going to have more cognitive resources available to, to, to you to figure stuff out. All right? So, um, and this quantification is really interesting also. Um, quantification is finding the numbers behind your observations. 
lot of artsy people are like, oh no, number is bad, I don't want to take the magic out of it. You know, there is nothing, numbers are magic. Just ask the Pythagoreans, right? It is, um, and it's just another tool for finding the patterns. It's a way of simplifying and finding the patterns in the world around us. And if you're intentionally using all three of these systems in your notes, you'll get more information. You'll have more of that raw data to then be able to think about and make your assumptions. So um, I've got homework for everybody in this room. Your homework assignment is, is I want you to, um, to go find two different things on two different days that you are, and let yourself go curiosity crazy on them. Document, record it in your book. Use whatever of those heuristics you want. But I want you in that to use writing and drawing and quantification to do that. Right? You'll see that each one of those will just get your brain to look in a slightly different way. Quantification could be like, you know, I'm in a time. Like, what's the time to the next spout? Right? How, often, how long are they staying down? Right? Counting things, measuring things, all that sort of stuff is quantification. The patterns hidden behind the numbers will then start to come out and reveal themselves to you as well. To help you with this, and as a little bit of motivation, here's the deal. If you promise to have a little bit of, to include quantification in your observation wonder session, I have for you a party favor. All right, I went and I have these made. This is the official Nature Journal Club. I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of measuring tape. Metric and standard. Use the metric though, right? And um, they're, they're great little things. They've got, it says, I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of, printed on the side of it, my sort of observation mantra. And if you are willing to just sort of bust out and try some, see what happens, how does it get your brain work a little bit different? You throw some quantification in there. You know, let me like, oh no, it is math, math, math. No, 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 math, just another way of communicating, thinking about the world, another modeling system. If you're willing to use that, you get to walk home with one of these. Who wants one? Ooh. Ooh, you don't? Oh, you, oh, you don't. <laughs> I don't need this to take it. All right, here we go. Thank you. Can you So we're not done yet. We're not done yet. We're just getting going. I just wanted to give you a party favor to kind of like <laughs> um, As you are doing your own process of figuring things out, there are, there are a couple of, of problems that we regularly bump into in a way we kind of reason our way through problems. Um, one of these is confusing the idea of just because two things occur together that one caused the other. It's called confusing... Um, Causality. Sorry, sorry, sorry? Causality. Yep. So we're, we're looking... Um, correlation and causation. Right? So here is a graph of the divorce rate in Maine with the per capita consumption of margarine. Right? And you can see that as the margarine consumption has been going down, it's been great for our relationships. Right? So it's better with butter. <laughs> so, um, so just because two things co-occur doesn't mean that one caused the other. Right? Um, it could be that one caused the other. Another possibility is that there's something else that's driving both of them. Or it could be that they just by chance are the same and it's just unrelated. So here's another one. This is the number of letters in the world, the winning word in the National Spelling Bee. We have a number of people killed by venomous spiders. Right? So again, correlation does not necessarily mean that there's causation there. Kind of have to read this one twice. <laughs> Uh, so, 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 so as you're figuring these things out yourself, um, you also want to think about, you know, what is your own sample size? How many are you looking for? for? Um, are you um, also, as you're looking for evidence, are you creating a biased sample? Um, there's this old story about a person who's, you know, kind of under the street light, going like this. 
guy walks up and says, you know, hey, hey, hey buddy, what's, what's, what's wrong? He says, oh man, I can't believe it, I lost my keys. Lost my keys. And he says, well, where'd you lose me? He says, yeah, over there in the parking lot. <laughs> I said, what are you doing over here? He says, this is where the light is. <laughs> All right, that's a sampling error. All right, um, true story of a, uh, a young biologist um, in, uh, who was making a map of the distribution of wood rat houses in Tilburn Park, right? And there were some up under the eucalyptus trees, and those were all very carefully mapped from topographic map, you know, run compass, very precise locations. And then there's this other part, away from the eucalyptus tree forest, that is this brushy, tangled, dense area filled with poison oak, and some places a really boggy soil. Well, it turns out that, the, that the, the wood rat nests were distributed throughout the eucalyptus forest, and also right along the edge of this poison oak area, right along the edge. Hmm. You know, could that be their distribution? Or could it possibly be that that young biologist didn't want to go into the poison oak? Right? So I never went in there. I never mapped any. Right? And then there, here's my map. This is the distribution of, you know, it's like interesting. These ones are almost a little line here, right along the edge of that. I'm like, oh, it must be because they don't like the eucalyptus forest, and right in that area, they're really adjacent to it. Hmm. Right? So that's an example of sampling bias. Um, but there's so much stuff that we can figure out just by sitting on a stump and observing. All right, this again, going back to Marcello's notes, I love this stuff that he does on, on frigate birds. He just got totally curious about how these birds move through the air, the dynamics of their flight, how that relates to what the waves are doing and how they ride the waves and then catch the next one, how that relates to wind direction. If you let curiosity pull you, it will, you can fill volumes as you yourself discover all the stuff that is in books was just discovered by somebody else and written in there. You get to do it yourself also. Right? The, 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 the last piece of this, though, so this is when you can directly observe what's going on. Some phenomenon out there you cannot directly observe. And this is where inference comes in. So um, I can observe when um, um, I can uh, observe when the um, migrating geese come into the pond near my house. Right? I can observe when. Right? But what I cannot directly observe is why they did that. Right? I can come up with some guesses, but I, you can never directly observe why. Right? Other things you can't directly observe. You find some animal tracks. I can't directly observe who did that. Right? That's not a why question, but I can't directly observe who did it. I have to use inference. And inference is probably the piece that is the least understood in all of this. And so what I want to do is just unpack the structure of inference for you. Because if you understand the structure of inference, it becomes incredibly useful. But there's a lot of confusion about it. Because the way that most people use inference is like this. They, they, they say, um, uh, let's see. What, what was the uh, example that I said you can't observe? Animal tracks. So, so um, why they came into the pond? Why they came into the pond? Right. Um, I would say you know I, I, the geese came into my um, pond um, because uh, or, or they, 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 they left because of day length, right? Or or, they're, or they're, they they came in because of changes in the temperature that have. Uh, cued their migration. They came in because they saw other geese do it, and it was peer pressure, right? Uh, so what I can do, now there are several different possibilities there. What most of us tend to do is we stop with the first really kind of plausible explanation, right? Oh, geese respond to day length. Somebody says day length. You go, okay, it could be day length, right? Yeah, day length, or, or, or it's temperature, temperature. And then we go like, that's it. We find the first kind of plausible explanation, and we stop right there, right? That's the danger. All right? We stop with what makes sense. All right? The first thing that really kind of makes sense to us, oh, I must have it, because we're uncomfortable with the question sitting out there. But for inference, it looks like this. So why questions or things that you cannot be directly observed, the way we tackle that 
is through this process of inference. And we don't just find the first, most likely explanation. What we do is inference is a very creative process. It gets creative and then it gets rigorous, but it first starts with creative. So with the creative part, what you do is you come up with as many different possible, plausible explanations of why that could be. Why are those geese, you know, leaving the pond? It could be this, 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 or this, or this. And what I do is I come up, well, it could be this, 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 or this. These are my alternate explanations of why that could be. And in doing this, I want to spend most of my time in the sort of realm of the plausible and probable, but maybe spend a little bit of time in some out-of-the-box ideas. Sometimes that kind of creative thinking can really, um, well, can spur creative thinking. Or sometimes you want to leave the room room for there's something else going on there that you really don't um, you're, you're not wrapping your head around. So a little bit of time in that, but it's often not a very it's an important but a not a very high percentage area. All right. Um, so I get my different explanations, and then what I also do is I will often leave room in my thinking for it could be this 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 or it could be just something else that I haven't thought of yet, right? So I don't want to have the hubris to assume that I've come up with all the good ideas, right? So once I've got, so what does this look like on your journal? So this is, um, I mean, look at this curiosity explosion. So I unpacked this and I discovered that on this page, so there's this, this rose that's blooming a uh, second time and there's some differences in the, in the, the, the blooms. Um, Fiona, as she's doing this, I looked at some of her questions. She has some how questions on here. She also has some why questions in here that are kind of interesting. And I took a closer look at those. And I discovered that what she's doing here is on well, those, she's actually got multiple explanations, multiple possible explanations for what she's thinking about. This is a very powerful way of not making yourself do linear thinking. Oh, I've got my answer and locking into that. So here she's, she's saying that they seem to have more aphids, um, in the, uh, more problems with aphids than they did in the first bloom, right? Um, so, and then off of that, she asks, do the aphids not mind the heat? Right, so maybe the aphids are really, uh, maybe this heat is great for the aphids. Then she also writes, or do the predators of the aphids, uh, uh, so, so do the aphids like the heat, or do their predators not like the heat? So she's wondering, there's more aphids now. She came up with two ideas, maybe the heat's good for them, there's a big heat storm going on at this point. She's also thinking maybe that's harming their predators. So she's not getting herself locked into either one of these as a plausible explanation. And how easy would it be able to, to say, well, I see this, well, here's something plausible and just stop there. So um, when you've got a why question, at least get several options on the table. And you can stop there if you want. If you want to go a little bit further, that's where the rigorous part of inference comes. Right? So this is something I regularly do. I've got a why question. My brain goes, oh, why question? Right? That's divergent. I'm going to come up with alternate hypothesis. Could be this, 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 this. Sometimes that's as far as I get in the field. But sometimes what I do is I say, I really kind of, this idea I, I really like. And I'm gonna, what I'm, I do is I say to myself, if this explanation is true, if that explanation is true, then I would expect to see this and this and this. If that's so, I would expect to see these things, right? Uh, so those are my predictions that I would make. If that is true, then these are the predictions that fall out from that. So if it's true that you are migrating, you're, you're going to start a migration because of a temperature cue, then I would expect in uh, times when it's abnormally, unseasonably warm towards the winter, that the migration gets delayed. That would be a prediction that would follow from that explanation, right? And then I can go out in the field and see if I see that. See if I see that in multiple places and under different conditions. And um, if I don't, I can say, well, that's a prediction I made. Um, but we can also make other predictions from the other things. But if that's a a prediction I made, and I don't see that. Oh, not you yet. All right. 
Uh, then I can cross that off the list. I didn't see that. And that ends up being really significant. What I do is I try to make predictions. And here's the hard part. Um, the thing that moves the ball down the field the most is if I make predictions and I don't see those. Because then what I do, I can start to say, it starts to be really unlikely that this is the explanation for that. And let me sort of show you why this sort of idea of kind of eliminating possibilities um, and trying to disprove an idea is, is hard. It's, it's, it's kind of a little bit counterintuitive. People want to prove themselves right. In this inference structure, I actually move the ball down the field by if I can find evidence against an idea. Right? Um, so kind of going back to this, here's a little uh, brain teaser for you. So if the card has a, here's the statement, if the card has a vowel on one side, then it must have an even number on the other side. So if a vowel must have even, which two cards would you turn over to test that rule? Four. Four. Isn't that interesting? How many people felt themselves drawn to A and 4 at the start? I did. I look at this and I go A and 4. Because what I want to do is I say, if I turn over 4, then I'm going to have, uh, if there's an A there, I, you know, I've proven myself right. right? I, I'm looking for confirmation that I'm right. right? But look at the trap. If I had that, all right, I have done nothing to disprove this rule, right? On the other hand, if I turn over the 7 here, and the 7 is a vowel, I now know that this is false. No matter what I get when I turn it over this, it's not going to disprove this rule, right? But I can actually move the ball down the field by testing this one, if I, if I can, you see how I'm, I'm not trying to prove myself right, right, and be deep in confirmation bias land. Um, and also this whole idea of proof, proof is the language of mathematics, right? Because in mathematics you own the system, you own all the rules. In science we actually can't do a proof, right? We can say the evidence supports this idea, but I don't know proof, can't do a proof because I don't know all the rules for the system. I'm looking at the system trying to figure out how it works. In math, you can say, these are the rules for Euclidean geometry. Given that, here's my group. Right? So, in this, I can say, I think it's highly unlikely that this is what's going on. And I move the ball down the field. So I actually move the ball down the field by eliminating possible explanations. Um, here's an example of how this might look in the, the, the field. Or I shouldn't say eliminate it, but at least getting my brain to think that it is less likely. So I'm out there, I'm looking at a kestrel, it is on a fence post as close as I am to you, right? Right outside my car window, in a big windstorm. And it hasn't flown away, so I start thinking, that's really weird, it's really close to me. Why did not this fly away? So, ooh, that's a why question. What do I do? What do you do with why questions? Possibilities. Right? So I come up with as many possibilities as I can. And notice I've got the little placeholder for the other possibilities I haven't thought of yet. Right? So I could stop right there. Right? I've taken my why question. Here's the next logical step with the why question. But then while I'm watching this thing, all of a sudden it stretches its wings and in this howling wind that's shaking the car, lifts off the perch, floats over, it seems effortlessly over to the next fence post, and seem to have no problem flying. Right. So I think, huh, that's weird. It didn't really seem to have too much difficulty in flying around. That makes it less likely that that is what's going on. Right? So I'm going to say, no, I think it's probably not that. So this is understanding the structure of inference and how I can move the ball down the field. Right? Still holding that with humility is a very, very powerful way to try to figure things out. So it helps to understand that structure. And I only need to do this when I cannot directly observe what I'm trying to figure out. If I'm trying to figure out, you know, how often do the humpbacks come up? Right? I start timing. Right? If I'm trying to figure out why, 
I can't directly, if I can't directly observe that, then I'm using this process of inference. First generate my ideas, then you can dig down in any one of those. So this is a framework for asking better questions. This is an invitation to let curiosity be part of your regular experience in journaling. The more that you let curiosity into your nature journal, the more fun this whole process becomes. And when you're doing that, you're going to want to grab your nature journal all the time. You're going to associate it with that rush of dopamine. You're going to become a dopamine addict. <laughs> right? And um, that's, a, that's a really, really healthy, good thing. When you have questions, you're going to think to yourself, is this something that I'm going to look up? If so, what caveats do I have around that? Is this something that I'm going to directly observe? How do I need to approach that so I'm not biasing my thinking? Or is this something where I'm going to be using this process of inference? inference? And all of those give you a really powerful and flexible and creative way to play with the wonders and mysteries of this world. The more we figure out about this world, it doesn't detract from the mystery. Because every solved problem reveals 50 other ones waiting to be solved. Yes, sir? Oh, this little critter had a dead vole, and it captured a vole. And then it started, this was my analysis of it starting to kind of tear that little vole apart. Oh. Yeah, yeah, vole. So, thank you for coming. I hope that this is, becomes a useful part of your journaling experience. I'm not saying this is the only way or the right way. You have to do it this way. But I'm going to say, you want to keep that measuring tape? Give this a try. Right? Just give me two drawings, mess around with it, see what happens. And you may discover that intentionally inviting curiosity into your process opens worlds of wonder. Thank you for coming. Oh boy, I'm looking forward to this trip.